great. Um, okay, okay so, so historians have this kind of cliched story we tell ourselves that we were a very, uh, so as, as much as Miguel kind of characterized us this morning as a discipline that's about immersing ourselves in the past and sort of getting into the moment, we, we sort of, we have this, uh, this mythos that we're a deeply empirical discipline that our, we sort of live to get into the archives to read documents and sort of follow where the documents take us, uh, that we want to uh, sort of surround ourselves with the kinds of evidence that develop our stories um, and, uh, and we can take a, a document that can completely change our interpretation of the history if we know enough about the context and are able to, um, to follow the document where, where it takes us. Um, I was always really skeptical of this story, um, this idea that uh, any single document or any single folder of documents could fundamentally change the trajectory of your research, could fundamentally change what you consider to be the important factors in a historical story you were telling. Uh, that just didn't match with my understanding of how historical interpretation and historical research worked. Um, and what I want to show you for this half hour presentation is, uh, is the research experience that changed my mind about that. Um, that showed me the sort of, the, the possibility of, of, of where, uh, where archives can force you to look in different places for the stories you were expecting to find um, and how following archives to those places can, uh, can change your understanding of some really basic aspects of historical phenomena of interest. Um, and the particular historical phenomenon of interest that I, uh, that I started out researching was, uh, was the history of modern mathematics, um, which I understood to be a story that was largely based in uh, Western Europe with some important uh, ties to the, um, to the Soviet Union, uh, especially during the, the Cold War period. Um, there's some sort of North American presence in that story. Um, and what I'm going to show is how a, a sort of series of archival uh, encounters um, push my understanding of this story of what it means for mathematicians to be modern, what the scope of the American, of the American modern is in mathematics, um, how that changed in relation to these other sort of key words from the subtitle, uh, regional hegemony, global connections, um, mathematics as not just a form of knowledge but as a profession, um, and the role of the changing dynamics, politics, cultures, uh, and circumstances of mid 20th century Latin America. Uh, the story starts with this photograph. Um, this is a photograph of uh, one of the main characters of my research. It's a French mathematician named Laurent Schwartz. Uh, this is an absolutely iconic photograph of him. Uh, if you look at any sort of memorial volume to him and uh, websites about him, this is the photograph you see. Um, it's uh, this sort of young, dynamic, smiling uh, French professor at the blackboard, um, clearly in the middle of a really engaging lecture. Um, and Whenever you see this photograph, uh, you see it presented sort of without a context. I mean, he's in front of a blackboard, but where is the blackboard? Nobody knew. Um, what, is, what exactly is he doing at the blackboard? Why is he there in that particular context? Um, mathematicians didn't know. Historians didn't know. His family didn't really know. It was a long time ago. Um, so you'd see captions like, the mathematician at the board, or the mathematician in his classroom. Um, and, and that would be the kind of the, the very sort of bare bones history associated with, with the photograph. So I went to Paris to find out more about, uh, about this man, this photograph, this mathematics. Um, and so at the suggestion of a friend of mine, I uh, scheduled a couple days to visit the archives of, of UNESCO, um, about which we've heard a little bit earlier, but the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Uh, not really expecting to find anything, and indeed, the experience of my first day at UNESCO was not finding anything. Um, sort of flipping through folder after folder of relatively innocuous, uninteresting discussions uh, about general scientific policy. They hardly seemed interested in mathematics. Uh, the very end of the day, I had about 20 minutes left before I had to um, catch the, uh, the train back to where I was staying. Uh, and I open a folder and I see uh, this document. Um, so for those of you who don't read Spanish, um, or French in this case, yeah, Spanish or French, um, uh, what this was is a, uh, a request for assistance from Argentina uh, issued in 1957 uh, and uh, you can see in this line here, sort of second from the bottom of that paragraph, that they were requesting assistance from two specific individuals, uh, a, a Professor R. San Juan from Madrid and a Professor L. Schwartz from Paris. Um, so this is someone I was not expecting to find at all in the archive and there he was at the end of the long day in this folder. Um, 
so that opened up a lot of questions. Uh, why someone in, uh, in Argentina in 1957 interested in this mathematician who I had largely associated um, just with sort of elite French mathematics? Um, why is he being paired with this particular professor? Why is UNESCO interested in him? Um, and so I did what one does when uh, you're a historian and have uh, access to some opportunities and time to, um, to travel and find things out. I scheduled a trip um, to South America to investigate. Um, and the first stop on that trip was UNESCO's Latin American headquarters uh, in Montevideo. Um, so UNESCO, uh, well, we'll get to that story later. So, so here's what I found in Montevideo. I found that same fo uh, photograph uh, in a folder uh, in the back of, the, of a collection of photographs by the sort of major professor of mathematics at uh, the University of the Republic of, uh, of Montevideo, uh, Rafael La Guardia. Um, and not only did I find a copy of that photograph, uh, I found this annotation on the back of the photograph that gave the exact time, place, context, and circumstances of the photograph. So instead of being a kind of disembod uh, di dislocated, uh, presumably European setting of a charismatic French mathematician in a French classroom uh, lecturing about French mathematics, um, this suddenly became a picture of a French mathematician in a circumstance of transnational exchange uh, tied to specific UNESCO programs in a specific time, in a specific place in Montevideo in 1952. Um, so over the course of this project, I've followed Laurent Schwartz and his theory of distributions. This is the main mathematical theory he's associated with uh, around the world. These are all spots where I've documented people working on the theory of distributions. Um, I've looked at archives in a lot of those places, um, uh, although I unfortunately yeah, I haven't been to some of them, but I've had sort of relatively direct documentation of people studying the theory of distributions within the first year of the theory's proposal in all of these different places. Um, and I think this, this represents um, for its time, uh, a, a, complete, a complete change, a sort of almost radical shift in the scale of new mathematical theories. So before the 1940s, uh, a mathematician who was previously unknown um, would be lucky if within a decade people in multiple countries were discussing, uh, discussing their new theory. Um, but here was a mathematician who up until the mid-1940s was almost unheard of outside of France. And by the mid-1950s, there are people on six different continents who are actively discussing and researching a theory that he's proposed. Um, so this kind of radical transformation in the scale of mathematical research uh, and the geographic scope of mathematical research um, became the new focus of, of the project. Um, I've published quite a bit about the Latin American dimensions of this story here, a couple of citations, um, but you can find those all on my website, so I won't, uh, won't dwell on that. Um, I want to sort of so just point out that the, there are a lot of different dimensions of this story. Um, uh, one has to do with the relationship between technical assistance programs and fellowship programs. Uh, one has to do with the changing nature of mathematical theories themselves. That's one that I'm not going to get into in this, uh, in this presentation. But I think the nature, of, uh, the nature of abstraction and reasoning and metaphor in mathematics had to change uh, in order for this change in scale to be possible. That's the middle article there. Um, and it also has to do with the history of bu uh, bureaucracy in mathematics. Uh, so there had to be changes in administrative practices that allowed um, money and people uh, and uh, programs and institutions to move uh, between different continents in ways that weren't, uh, weren't previously normal or, or even in some, uh, some respects possible. Um, it's important in the story to put it in the context of, um, uh, of theories of sort of so-called colonial science um, or uh, science in the periphery. So the, the classic punching bag in this field uh, is an article by George Basala from 1967 called The Spread of Western Science, uh, which in turn was based on a model of economic development proposed by Walt Whitman Rostow um, in 1959. Uh, it's the idea that um, so as science moves from centers to peripheries, um, it has a kind of a seed that's being planted uh, by, um, by people from the center, uh, and the people from the center then sort of build up institutions that um, are always sort of in relation or with respect to the center in all of their activities, um, and then eventually enough of a local institutional culture builds up um, that, um, that a, they start getting a little bit of a, a degree of autonomy, even though it's an autonomy that's always um, figured sort of relative or in, with respect to the center. Uh, and then eventually the institution gets so effective and, and, and so successful um, that it starts producing original science, original ideas, original work of its own right, even to the point of starting to attract people from the former centers um, to, um, 
to the places that started out as peripheries um, because of their new scientific eminence. So this is obviously not what happens historically, but I think it's important to understand this as the backdrop to the story because the very people who are involved in setting up these fellowship programs, these technical assistance uh, exchanges, the people who are formulating the programs that I'm talking about, this is how they think it works. Um, so we're talking about the period when these ideas about the spread of Western science are being developed, uh, articulated, debated, and, theor and proposed. Um, and so the fact that uh, program administrators, UNESCO officials, um, people who want to build up a mathematical culture in Latin America thinks it, think it works this way, has an enormous effect on the program. It's not the effect that they intended to have, um, but it is an important effect. Um, this kind of model of colonial mathematics is really important um, in the period just before the one I'm focusing on uh, in a series of um, uh, a series of uh, investments and sort of philanthropic interests and other sorts of exchanges um, that we can sort of lump under the general category of colonial mathematics. Um, this is sort of their term, the actor's conception of what they're doing as colonial in the this, in this sense of a, of a basala spread of Western science. Um, so you have fellowship programs like the John Simon Guggenheim's foundation uh, in the 1930s through the uh, 1940s that established um, uh, North America, South America um, movement of, of fellows. Uh, in various scientific, uh, scientific and cultural fields. Uh, and these programs were mainly seen as tools of building cultural ties um, as a way of sort of smoothing the exchange of commercial ties between North and South America. Um, this was reflected in formal governmental policies, most famously uh, Roosevelt's good neighbor policy, um, for which he established the Office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation, which played an integral role in financing uh, and bringing scholars to the University of Sao Paulo when it was founded in the 1930s. Um, with the outbreak of the Second World War in Europe, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, which had been primarily invested uh, in Europe for its international scientific endeavors, basically took their Paris office, uh, relocated back to New York, and said, focus your attention on exchanges with North and South America. So a lot of the infrastructures that had been sort of honed in uh, European scientific, Western European scientific context in the 1930s um, end up forming a new kind of institutional basis uh, for fellowship programs in 1940s and 1950s South America. Um, they built on the work of uh, the sort of the institution building of key European migrants. Um, some important ones for this story um, are Julio Rey Pastor, uh, that's considered the founding father of South American mathematics, uh, who came from Spain to Buenos Aires in the first part of the 20th century. Um, uh, another key figure is Luigi Fantapie, uh, who was uh, the sort of main figure behind the mathematics library and the initial mathematics department in Sao Paulo. Um, the interesting thing about Fantapie is he originally comes as kind of an ambassador from fascist Italy um, with the support of Mussolini's government. So the mathematics library in Sao Paulo uh, from its founding even to this day has sort of a world-class collection of mathematics books and it also has a, a, a quite extensive literature of, of fascist political tracts um, from uh, from Mussolini's government and this kind of dual political mathematical role reflects the same kinds of assumptions about the relationship between mathematical research uh, and cultural exchange uh, present in the Guggenheim programs. Um, later, uh, later interwar and wartime arrivals from Europe in, uh, in South America, uh, even to the, some of the same departments, came as refugees of fascism or refugees of the war. Um, so you get, uh, especially the Jewish refugees like Beppo Levi, who becomes a very important figure in Argentina. Uh, it becomes a figure in history of si uh, historiography of science uh, a bit later on, um, but starts there as a mathematician. Um, there, uh, under the Office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Inter Affairs, a number of mathematicians during World War II, when they can't easily travel to Europe, uh, end up taking long trips across the southern cone uh, of South America. Um, initially, George David Burkhoff, um, following in the wake of some certain physicists, especially cosmic ray physicists, um, but also sort of following like Orson Welles, cultural figures um, uh, who, who made the, uh, make these trips to build cultural, um, cultural ties in the hemisphere. Um, Marshall Stone ends up being a very important figure in founding international mathematical institutions after the war, um, gets his taste for it in his trip to South America in 1943. Um, there's a separate kind of strain of connections established by high-profile East Coast American mathematicians uh, in institutions in Mexico, uh, most notably Norbert Wiener, uh, the founder of the field of cybernetics, um, and Solomon Lefschetz, a Princeton mathematician um, uh, who had various exchanges of doctoral students. And, and the interesting thing for the res relative to this story is that um, these relatively robust ties to Mexico end up 
not really having um, much, um, much of a role to play in the programs that end up happening toward the southern cone of South America. Um, and so there's a really interesting disconnect, even in programs that are conceiving themselves of as, as South American in a kind of, um, uh, wi you know, kind of wide view, um, uh, end up in interesting ways excluding Mexico and in other ways excluding the Caribbean um, uh, while still claiming the mantle of Latin American mathematics. Um, there's uh, these American efforts then provide uh, an agglomeration of resources for, uh, for directing a, a wide range of Western European, especially war refugee uh, Western European mathematicians to, um, to key sites in South America. Uh, most famously, Andre Vey, probably the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, spent uh, three of what he considered the worst years of his life in Sao Paulo in 1944 to 1947. Um, uh, co certain collaborators, Oscar Zariski uh, from 1945, Jean Dudenay from 1946 to 47, Jean Dalsart from uh, 48. Um, one of the key things that unites these visitors is they all had pretty close professional ties to people like Marshall Stone at the University of Chicago. Um, and so those initial, um, those initial connections then gave rise to further connections by uh, propagating across uh, scholarly networks. Um, there were a lot of conversations within the, the organizations that funded these kinds of exchanges about uh, under what conditions it made sense to send mathematicians in training from Latin America to North America versus when it was better to rely on North Americans going to South America to build up institutions. Um, so there is a letter, for instance, um, discussing a possible Rockefeller Fellowship uh, for uh, a mathematician um, in Sao Paulo, uh, Omar Katunda, um, where Oscar Zariski advises that uh, it's really a bad time to send him north at just the very moment when the department in South America is being strengthened by two, and he initially writes foreign, and then he crosses it out and writes competent mathematicians. Um, so there's this premise that the only way to develop a kind of basic competence is to have contact with, um, with highly trained European mathematicians. Um, one key European visitor sort of is this collective author, Nicolas Bourbaki, um, who I've talked with a bunch of you about in different contexts. Um, I'll just flag here that um, uh, the distinctive kind of mathematics that ends up being very important in South America has a lot to do with its, uh, the particular work of uh, visitors associated with a very narrow and unrepresentative cultural formation um, uh, from North America and Europe. Um, having to do, uh, often associated with radical politics as well as radical philosophies of mathematics that um, made them in many ways more disposed to take um, quite lengthy trips abroad um, to sort of proselytize for their mathematics in, in new places. Um, and as an early consequence of these initial efforts and exchanges, Latin America was uh, relative to its larger uh, mathematical community disproportionately well represented at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1950, which was held for the first time um, outside of Europe. Uh, or that's not true. Uh, it's in 1924 in, in Canada. So, so that, but that was so. The 1924 Congress is a weird case. But the, for the, the first sort of successful International Congress of Mathematicians outside of Europe uh, was in 1950 um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and you can see the, the official Latin American delegations sort of listed here um, in very small print as a way of emphasizing um, just how many, uh, how many people were officially uh, deputed from Latin American institutions, um, despite what many considered um, at the time uh, to be relatively sort of nascent, uh, sort of inchoate professional communities that were not otherwise especially well integrated uh, with um, with international mathematics, but because of the specific personal connections established in the 1940s um, between uh, East, East Coast um, U.S. American mathematicians and certain South American counterparts, they ended up being very well represented at this Congress. At the same time, the, organizer, the American organizers of this Congress um, saw this as kind of the emerging, the coming out uh, of American mathematics from its own period of colonial tutelage to European mathematics. So the um, at the same time that, uh, that North American mathematicians were um, sort of making what they saw as colonial inroads to South American mathematics, um, they saw this in, in, in a sense as an indication of their emergence from, um, from a period when they depended in the same ways they were trying to establish in South America on, uh, on travel and correspondence and exchange and reference to French, uh, German, and British institutions uh, for their, their mathematical education. 
this 1950 International Congress, Laurent Schwartz uh, sort of gets his uh, coming out to the world. He's, he's a winner of one of two Fields Medals. Uh, and at the opening ceremony, he's basically announced to everyone who's present as uh, more or less the future of mathematics, the brightest young face with the coolest new idea. Um, and uh, so importantly, because there are all of these South American uh, mathematicians in the audience, they all get the idea that the next big thing in mathematics is this young French mathematician, Laurent Schwartz. Um, in the meantime, uh, UNESCO, as part of UNESCO's sort of organizing vision, uh, uh, holds its third general, con uh, general Congress in Mexico City in 1947. This leads to the establishment of the, um, the Latin American uh, Office of UNESCO initially, um, uh, initially in Brazil because of uh, UNESCO's focus on um, biological research in the Hylian Amazon, um, but then relocated to Montevideo as a way to provide a sort of more, um, sort of more politically neutral and also, uh, or in sort of more geographically neutral, uh, but also more linguistically uh, um, sort of normative um, headquarters for, for UNESCO work in this period. Um, and it's because of a series of coincidences of uh, various visitors and travelers through Montevideo that the first um, congresses billed as pan-Latin American congresses of mathematics um, get held uh, in, connection with the, um, in connection with the Montevideo office. Uh, the first meeting is held in Punta del Este, which is about 100 kilometers outside of Montevideo. Um, in, in December 1951, and at that very first Congress, Alberto González Dominguez, who had been present in 1950 to see Schwartz win his Fields Medal, um, uh, gives a, a, a sort of his view of what, what is significant about Schwartz's new theory, and so starts to, to promote the theory in this area. Um, this leads to Schwartz's invitation to be uh, what I think was the very first official UNESCO technical assistance um, missionary to, uh, to South America, um, initially for a period of several months toward the end of 1952 in Rio de Janeiro, but including a side trip to the headquarters office in, uh, in Montevideo, where, um, uh, where he was greeted with this overwhelming reception. People had already been studying his theory. He was delighted to find that he, he could converse with people who already knew something about his work um, and sort of form this, this, uh, this important tie. Um, Schwartz saw his goal there as to, um, as to provide a kind of moral influence or a moral development on, um, on South American mathematics. So not just to ins instruct new theories, but to give a sense of this virtuous French um, culture of mathematical learning and mathematical education as a way of sort of pulling up the country's mathematical, uh, the region's mathematical education um, by its bootstraps by starting with uh, creating uh, robust cultures of research at the top, which would then support uh, cultures of teacher training, which would then support uh, mass education in mathematics in the schools, which would allow um, Brazil and, and uh, other countries in the region to, to become part of this global economic community um, in a new way. Uh, he has this whole elaborate theory of what exactly, what effect his, his visit would, um, uh, would do um, that depended on stays of different amounts of time in, um, by expert foreign professors. Um, but then one of the sort of key, uh, key parts of this, this visit, as I noted, was his visit, his, his sort of his side trip to Montevideo, um, as well as his, uh, uh, which associated with a, a quick stay over in Buenos Aires where he found that there was indeed already a mathematical community in South America interested in his work. Um, Schwartz's vision for sort of bootstrapping scientific education was one of the key ideas. Um, his colleague, Charles Erismann, pointed to a few other motivations why um, Schwartz's theory in particular would be attractive, in particular its association with, um, with the theoretical physics of um, of the quantum uh, and of, um, uh, of the atomic nucleus, uh, which Erisman kind of misleadingly associated with nuclear technology. Um, so it was, this is more of a sort of selling point for, um, for uh, government and, and uh, intergovernmental funders uh, rather than an actual practical effect on nuclear physics. One of the people Schwartz encountered was a mathematician named Leopoldo Nachbin, who was just starting his, uh, his career in Rio de Janeiro. Um, he uh, describes the formation of a new, uh, a new institute in Rio, supported by the National uh, Research Council there, um, uh, that gave Nachman a kind of a, a small degree of institutional autonomy. Um, and this sort of put Nachman on the map for, um, for a wide range of different um, opportunities to travel between, uh, between Brazil and, 
uh, North America and Europe, which he took extensive advantage of, um, uh, studying at the University of Chicago, um, working in various places in the United States as a fellow of the Rockefeller and Guggenheim Foundations. Um, and Nachbin in turn connected um, his countrymen, Mauricio Peixoto uh, and Elon Lagos Lima to, um, to these different kinds of funding sources um, uh, to create this, um, uh, this relatively significant uh, flow, of, um, uh, flow of fellowships and experts between, um, between this new institute in Rio de Janeiro and, um, and various key centers of, uh, of mathematics in North America uh, and Western Europe. Um, and the key sort of uh, key sort of thing to know about the, these programs is they're all designed on the pr on the principle uh, of circulation in the sense of completing a circuit. So all of these fellowship programs were designed um, as um, we saw a couple indications of uh, in, in presentations earlier today uh, that a fellow should go to um, go to a northern or central institution um, so that they can gain the kinds of contacts and connections uh, and experience with research programs um, that would then allow them to complete the circle and bring, um, bring that expertise and those connections back to home institutions. So people wouldn't be considered for fellowships uh, if they weren't sort of assured of a, of a resting place when they came back home uh, institutionally. Um, not been built on these, these connections, these models to, um, uh, to establish textbooks, research monographs, um, a series of international colloquia um, that, that established this relatively central place for, um, for this model of, of mathematics in, um, in Brazil. Um, at the same time, remember Alberto Gonzalez Domingos in Buenos Aires uh, himself was trying to work through different channels to establish regional hegemony. Gonzalez Domingos uh, didn't travel, he was, he was a, sort of an, an older generation. He didn't travel nearly as much between North and South America, and so the kind of international mathematics he ends up uh, establishing in Buenos Aires has a, has a pretty fundamentally different character from what Nachman is able to build in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Um, Gonzalez Dominguez is quite effective in the 1940s and 50s as, in establishing the University of Buenos Aires as a Spanish-speaking hub for South American mathematics. Um, he uses fellowship programs and visitors, in particular his ability to lobby for, um, for funds to bring people like Laurent Schwartz to Buenos Aires um, as, uh, as a way of building up resources and um, an institutional wherewithal w within Buenos Aires. He uses his proximity to Montevideo. Um, Buenos Aires and Montevideo are about a uh, two-hour ferry ride across uh, uh, the Rio Plat uh, from each other. Um, to, um, to commandeer the resources of international organizations. Um, he uses, um, uh, uses these resources to, uh, to organize major conferences that have a kind of official international backing. Uh, most significantly for this story, the 1954 um, second Latin American Symposium on Mathematics uh, in Mendoza. And um, it's at the Mendoza Symposium that already Julio Rey Pastor, remember that sort of founding father figure of, of uh, South American mathematics uh, has already begun to observe um, that the, uh, the enthusiasts of Lorenzo Schwartz um, were already making up some of the uh, South America's uh, sort of brightest young generation of, uh, of mathematicians. Um, it's this uh, kind of enthusiastic reception that creates the conditions for um, the memorandum that, that I started this talk with, um, which is a very sort of oddly specific request sent to um, sent to UNESCO headquarters in 1956, uh, where they're requesting some kind of technical assistance visitors. They, can, they wouldn't say who, but it would be ideal if they could uh, have someone uh, who's a specialist in analysis or topology, particularly the theory of distributions, and it would be great if they could lecture in France, or if not in French, or if not in French, then maybe in English. Um, so this very specific request was meant to leave, to make it, make basically own, only one viable candidate for the technical visitor, Laurent Schwartz, uh, and indeed in a handwritten note that followed um, the, the dean of the, uh, the Natural Sciences School, um, Jose Babini, um, uh, cl clarified that they didn't need me and Laurent Schwartz in case uh, UNESCO was having trouble figuring out who they meant. Um, so he said, yeah, no hemos dado nombres, uh, pero la descripción de las tareas corresponde a Laurent Schwartz. Um, so, uh, so Schwartz gets this invitation. He's, he's supported by a, a quite, um, quite well-funded UNESCO grant to come and, and give this um, 
three-month residency in, in Buenos Aires, where he gives a, a, a long series of lectures, works with a large number of students, um, builds up connections. They publish lecture notes from his, um, from his lectures, which are then distributed across the world. I found copies of these lecture notes in, uh, in New Jersey and in Paris and in India. Um, so they, they got, got around quite a lot. Um, so it helped put Buenos Aires on the map as a, as a mathematical uh, as a center. Um, but then this visit also became the foundation for a follow-up request, uh, initially to bring in a Soviet counterpart. Um, uh, Schwartz had made them aware of certain Soviet researchers who um, were relevant to his theory um, uh, to, to further the success of the visit. But in UNESCO's paper trail, that gets merged with another, um, another request to, um, to launch a new institute for mathematics, uh, which they were going to model uh, on the, uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, which had recently been founded uh, in, uh, in Bombay in India. Um, and so the idea was that the, the great success of Schwartz's visit was proof that um, robust international ties um, to Latin American mathematics through a hub in Buenos Aires um, could redound to the benefit of all involved. Um, and this was in a period uh, in the late 1940s and 1950s when mathematical institutes were popping up all over the world. So there's the new institute in Rio, there's the Tata Institute in Bombay, um, there was a new institute in the suburbs of, uh, suburbs of Paris, uh, there's a proposal for a new institute in Chicago. Um, so this idea of creating new institutes was in the air and they thought they could use the success of Schwartz's UNESCO visit as a, um, uh, as a vehicle for, um, for affirming in perpetuity the centrality of Buenos Aires in, um, uh, in international mathematics. They argued that they had a sufficient library there to support this kind of research. They had a sufficient research culture. Um, and they also made this case borrowing from Schwartz's conception of international exchange uh, of the importance of having the cent center, as they so said, tanto técnica como moralmente, so as much, um, as much for technical reasons as for reasons of morale and for reasons of, uh, of sort of more, uh, moral influence in the, uh, in the region. Um, so there was a sense that by investing in mathematical exchange, uh, you, can, you can establish a broader sort of uplift. Um, there are a number of other reasons specifically for Buenos Aires. There's a kind of personal argument that there are already these, this large collection of mathematicians who have personal ties to Buenos Aires. Um, there's a political argument um, about uh, the relationship between uh, international funding versus domestic funding under, uh, under the Perón regime uh, in Argentina and the, uh, the way that can be redressed by UNESCO investment. And there's a geographic argument um, based on established um, uh, uh, flight and boat corridors for accessing South America that Buenos Aires was kind of an, uh, uh, an ideal entry point for any international mathematician who wanted to make a broader visit to the region. Um, there were competing efforts to, to make the case for other locations. There were proposals from La Plata, from, um, uh, from mathematical institutes in, uh, in Colombia. Um, and the sort of the general impression that UNESCO had was that there was very little consensus about the appropriateness of Buenos Aires as this, uh, this location for a UNESCO center. Um, so, you know, beneath, uh, beneath a lot of Latin politeness, as one of the, uh, the reporters put it, um, there was a lot of opposition on the part of non-Argentinian uh, non uh, participants. Um, uh, Nachbin himself uh, was, was absolutely furious that the, the selection of Buenos Aires seemed like a kind of fait accompli. I um, thought it was very important that, that UNESCO build up on the existing institute that he had helped establish in Rio de Janeiro. Um, as Juan Ibanez Gomez observed, there was a veritable lucha de hegemonia, hegemonic struggle um, uh, in, in the current scientific movement. And, and so there was this tension that uh, a lot of letters from this period express between uh, wanting to have one's own institution be the center for training uh, advanced mathematics uh, in Latin America uh, from the uh, sort of competing, um, competing imperative of rallying around a location as so as to be able to secure the UNESCO funding to have this, um, this center for training. So you have these kind of competing impulses um, and uh, sort of competing motivations for um, um, for where to locate this um, uh, for where to locate the, the center, and then at the same time, the other the other thing to note is that there's um, the kind of implicit construction of Latin America uh, in even the organizational procedures that go into the founding of the center. So there were no representatives whatsoever from any Mexican or Caribbean institutions even invited to these conversations of 
uh, where to put a pan Latin American um, uh, center for mathematics. So, so these kinds of, uh, the presumption that, that a Latin American center would be somewhere in, um, in South America and most likely in the Southern Cone uh, or what was already shaping uh, what was possible uh, for this institution. Uh, the center opened in 1959. Uh, this is the first class of fellows pictured. Uh, these are their fellowship applications. Um, the first course offered there uh, included a course by, by Roque Scarfiello on the theory of distribution, so reinforcing the role of that theory in their self-conception. Um, and this center had a, a kind of mixed success. Um, it did focus on bringing in a wider, um, wider group of fellows from South America, but what they quickly found was that in most parts of South America, they didn't have access to a sufficient cohort uh, of students who were, uh, had the, the foundational training for more advanced methods that they planned to teach at the center in Buenos Aires, so that they ended up massively constricting uh, their, their regional intake of students. Um, the UNESCO technical assistance budget didn't keep up with the ambitions of the center. Um, and then they were also unable to centralize access to foreign experts who had other ways of getting to Montevideo and Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro and Bogota um, and Mexico City. Um, uh, so that their idea that they would be the obligatory um, st uh, initial stopping point for mathematicians visiting South America uh, didn't end up being the case in practice as n different opportunities for funding and travel um, came to light. Um, the center, uh, the, the paper trail for the center kind of trails off in the mid-1960s. There's no official documentation of the center's closing, um, but by the late 1960s, the center no longer exists. Um, there's another computing center that's founded around the same time, um, but it doesn't appear that there is a sort of transition from one into the other. Um, but it's sort of not unconnected with um, a series of um, political crackdowns in 1966 against uh, student demonstrators uh, at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, uh, sort of infamous in, in Argentine political history, um, but for, for a variety of factors having to do with international politics and local um, and local conditions, there wasn't the ability to withstand uh, to, to withstand and to sustain a center um, beyond different periods of political turmoil. Uh, the center that did sustain itself through a wide range of different political upheavals, dictatorships. Um, uh, um, uh, political changes, economic changes, uh, was the center in Rio de Janeiro. So successfully, in fact, that it um, uh, just last year, it was the host of its own International Congress of Mathematicians, the first one held anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere um, in 2018 at, 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 uh, in, in Rio de Janeiro. Um, and some of the things that made that institute much more successful was, were its ability to link itself more effectively to, uh, to the support of military funding within the Brazilian state, uh, which turns out sort of historically to be a much more robust and large-scale source of, um, of support for mathematical training. Um, its ability to be disconnected from the university system and so not beholden to uh, larger institutional architectures uh, and fellowship structures. Um, and the ability of key representatives of, those institu of the institutions in Rio de Janeiro to continue to maintain ties by traveling on a regular basis to North America and Europe. Um, uh, in order to build those personal connections outside of their home institution um, that they could then bring back with them. Um, and so that kind of contrast, I think, points to some, uh, some sort of uh, significant conclusions that, that, uh, about how we think of uh, the development and the spread of modern mathematics as a profession in the mid-20th century. Um, uh, a couple sort of just bullet point style observations. Uh, one is that technical assistance is always a multi-party endeavor and any party can undermine it. So what you saw from the UNESCO Center in Buenos Aires is that at various points, the, um, what was meant to be a big coming together of, uh, of regional, um, regional players with multinational uh, organizations and funding sources um, ended up being undermined by a number of points of vul vulnerability uh, from different parties to that, um, to that center. Um, the, this notion of mathematical colonialism is a key way of marshalling resources and directing them, but didn't determine um, directly how those resources end up, ended up transforming into institutions on the ground. Um, it's important to note that charismatic individuals uh, and charismatic theories matter gr a great deal for marshalling these resources and for organizing communities, um, but can do so in a variety of different ways. Um, and the kind of the, the, the bigger takeaway point uh, is, um, uh, is, is that 
in order to understand the, the relative sort of success and scale and movement of mathematical theories or uh, scientific theories and institutions uh, in, uh, in general in this, um, uh, in, this period, in this period, it's important to sort of see how those theories and the personalities involved in promoting these theories um, get wrapped into um, um, political and social and financial exchanges um, at, a, at a, uh, a range of scales and geographies that can extend much, uh, much further than, than one might initially suspect. So, thank you.